Hi, and welcome to Roswell United Methodist Church. My name is Michael Cromwell, and I have the joy of serving as one of the associate pastors here at RUMC. Thanks for joining us for our on-demand version of the sermon, which will be delivered later today. If you'd like to watch our services live, you can do so via our live stream at 9 o'clock and 11.15. Notice our different worship times and our different hours that we have now. You'll also be able to see the entire worship service on demand later this afternoon at rumc.com slash sermons. We are so glad that you are with us today. We're thankful for your presence and we're thankful for your generosity and the different ways that you are helping to make RUMC a place of community and faith. Let's have a word of prayer before we hear our sermon. Gracious and loving God, we love you so much and we are grateful for this day and this day that we have to worship you. May the words that we are to hear, may they not only pierce our ears, but pierce our hearts as well, that we might be changed in different people because of what you have to say to us today. We thank you and we love you all in Christ's name we pray, amen. Now let's hear our sermon from today. It was only a week ago, Jesus and his disciples were entering into Jerusalem along with pilgrims from all over the world. It's estimated over two million pilgrims were crowding into Jerusalem and the two small towns, Bethany and Bethphage, that were just right there close to Jerusalem. Jesus was entering in on a, a donkey and that's when people began to whisper, that's him. That's who? That's Jesus. Well, everybody recognized the name of Jesus because it was just a little more than a week ago that Jesus raised a man who'd been laying in the grave for four days. He asked for the stone to be rolled away from the tomb, and he, he shouted, Lazarus, come out. And out walked Lazarus, who'd been laying in the grave for four days. Now, you, you raise somebody who's been laying in the grave for four days, people are going to talk. And so people whispered, they, they passed, they, they shouted, they bragged that, that somebody named Jesus raised somebody, uh, Lazarus, who was dead in the grave for four days. So when they entered into Jerusalem, the word spread like wildfire, and they began to point. Now they're able to put a face with the name. And they began to shout, Hosanna, which means save us. They began to break off limbs from trees and palm branches and wave them. They even laid their clothes in the street. Now you start pulling off your clothes for somebody. This, this, this is something important going on. You start pulling off your clothes. And they laid their clothes in the street and shouted, Hosanna, which means save us. They said, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the king of Israel. They're starting to call him the king. And the disciples are a part of the parade. They're looking around and they're going, they've never received a welcome like this. Now they've received that kind of welcome where they had to, to shake off the dust from their sandals, but one where people are rising up, they're shouting, save us. They know they're a part of something big, something really big, that Jesus is going to win in a landslide and there's no, no need for a recount. That Jesus is a, a part of something that they get to be a part of too. They're so certain of his victory that they begin talking. Who's going to be a first lieutenant? Who's going to be a second lieutenant? Who's going to sit at his right? Who's going to sit at his left? Jesus doesn't congratulate their ambition at all. It's not until Thursday night that he gathers them in an upper room. And he begins to wash their feet. Now, they really don't understand this at all. A king washing feet. Kings don't wash feet. Jesus at another time says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Kings don't knock on doors either. They have doors opened for them. Or if they don't open, they, they have doors kicked down for them. This is not the kind of kingdom that the disciples are expecting at all. A kingdom where the king's washing feet, where the king's knocking on doors, this is not the kingdom they're expecting at all. 
But this is the kingdom that Jesus is ushering in. A kingdom that they're called to to usher in as well through a serving love. A serving love of God and a serving love of neighbor. Well, if they didn't understand the washing of feet, they, they they understood even less when Jesus that night brought out a a loaf of bread, and a cup. And he began to tell them that he was going to die. That on the cross he was going to die. And that he would rise again. And he, 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 he instituted a new covenant with this, this bread and this cup where every time that they ate this meal, they would remember his body and his blood Not set it in a special place and look at it, but they would eat it. They would take it in. That his body and his blood would live on the inside of them. Well, they began to protest. And Jesus began to tell them that they would all turn away. They would all deny him, but but one would betray him. That's not what they understood. The kind of kingdom that they'd be taking part in. But the story unfolds quickly. They go from that upper room to a garden. At least most of them went into the garden. Some wandered away. Some fell asleep. And one, Judas, he met a crowd of of Roman soldiers and temple guards. Now, that's a crowd that normally doesn't mingle together at all. But the Bible tells us that it's a Roman cohort, a battalion not a small crowd, a, large, a huge crowd of, of Roman soldiers. And along with temple guards, they, they come into the garden and the question Jesus gives to that crowd, whom do you seek? It's the same question that Jesus gives there at the empty tomb to Mary Magdalene. Whom do you seek? Whom do you seek? And the answer comes back, Jesus the Nazarene. And Jesus says, I am. And with those two words, I am, the Bible tells us that they they drew back and fell to the ground. A battalion of soldiers and, and temple guards fell to the ground with that kind of power. With that kind of power, you would think he would instantly be be entered into a, 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 a battle, a battle where where he would lead his soldiers, a battle of us and them, a battle of enemies and allies, a battle where they would be forced to submit with the power to not only raise Lazarus from the dead, but the power to where a battalion, a battalion of soldiers is put to the ground. That kind of power is the kind of power that... that the disciples could understand. But when they came to their feet, Jesus asked again, whom do you seek? (laughs) Well, my hunch is the fellow who answered the question the first time isn't the same fellow who answered the question the second time. (laughs) My hunch is that the second person who answered Jesus the Nazarene answered with a shaky voice. He said, Jesus the Nazarene. Again, Jesus answered, I am. Let them go. The disciples ran away. Jesus was bound, and he was led off by a sheep being led to the slaughter. That night, they, they had a mock trial. The next day, they beat him. They tortured him. They placed on his head the crown of thorns. He was led up a hill carrying his cross, a hill called Golgotha or the skull. And it was there that they nailed him to the cross. And in his last dying words, he said, Father, forgive them. Forgiveness. Forgiveness. Well, you ask the disciples what happened to Jesus. At that moment, they'd say, dead. They weren't asking for a recount. 
They weren't saying, well, wait till the, a few days from now, you, you'll see. No, dead. And what you do with dead people is you bury them, and that's what they did. Jesus was buried in a borrowed grave. They sealed the grave with a stone. Now, the women weren't able to prepare his body for the burial because at dark, that was the Sabbath day that began, and the law didn't allow them to do work on the Sabbath, like preparing a body for the burial. So on the first day of the week, this day, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb. She saw that the stone was rolled away, and so she ran to get Peter and the other disciples. Well, Peter, Peter and John ran to the tomb. John was a little younger, so he got there first, and he waited outside the tomb. Peter didn't wait at all. He ran into the tomb, and he saw that the grave was empty. The Bible tells us that they saw and believed. Well, we don't know what they believed because the Bible also tells us that they went home and they locked themselves in the house behind closed doors for fear. It was only Mary Magdalene who stayed there at the grave. And then Jesus' question. Jesus' question was given to her. Whom do you seek? She didn't answer it right off. She thought he, he must be the gardener. And so she, she, told, she told him, she said, If you know where they've carried him, tell me and I will take him away. That's when Jesus called her by name, Mary. And that's when she recognized him. That's when she clung to him. And that's when she ran to tell Peter and the other disciples that Jesus had risen. He is alive. And Jesus met the disciples in their homes behind closed doors, doors that were locked in fear. And this is what it tells us in John chapter 20, verse 19. When, therefore, it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, when the doors were shut where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in their midst and said to them, Peace be with you. And when he had said this, he showed them both his hands and his side. The disciples therefore rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus therefore said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. This isn't the only time that Jesus appeared to disciples. The same day, he appeared to two other disciples, Cleopas and another disciple, walking along the Emmaus Road. He talked to them, revealed Scripture to them about all the things that happened that day, about his resurrection. Well, they still didn't recognize him. It wasn't until the breaking of bread that their eyes were open. And they recognized that it was Jesus who had walked with them all along. Well, it's not just little handfuls of disciples here and there that he appeared to when he rose from the grave. We celebrate today because 1 Corinthians tells us that he appeared to 500 people at one time. And, and Paul even begins to name those people that he appeared to. This isn't a secret held by a handful. This is the good news, the, the coming of a kingdom that's celebrated and it's the coming of his kingdom here on this earth and in heaven that we celebrate this day. His kingdom that, that comes when his will is done. When in loving service we serve God and serve neighbor. A kingdom that comes when his death on the cross forgives you and me. And takes away every stumbling block. When he rose from the grave, that he gave us the great gift of his, his Holy Spirit. A spirit that gives the power of peace. The power of peace. Not just to disciples long ago, but that, that power to you and me. A power that we don't have here in this world. It's not the same kind of power that, that politicians seek after 
It's not the same kind of power that armies, that groups, the power to will and to force, to push. It's not that same kind of power that he ushers in. There's a story that helps me out here. It's a story of Corey Ten Boom. She wrote about, about her experience in a book called The Hiding Place. She and her family, during World War II, they were arrested by the Gestapo. They were arrested for housing Jews, trying to save them from certain death in the concentration camps. Well, because they were housing Jews, they were thrown into the concentration camp. And it was there that her father and her sister died. After the war, Corrie ten Boom, she went out into a war-torn Germany to tell them about the forgiveness and the power that Jesus offers because he is alive here today. Not because of, of he's a, off up in heaven somewhere, but because he is alive here today. That his, his power of forgiveness, his power of peace and healing, that it's available today. She gave a lecture in, in Munich. After her talk, there was a man who, who came to her. As he was approaching her, she recognized the man, that his, his face was hauntingly familiar. That night he was wearing a gray coat, but that's not the way she saw him. She saw him instead in a black coat with a hat that bore the skull and crossbones. He was a part of the SS. He was one of the cruelest of all the guards at Ravensbrück concentration camp. She remembered having to walk in front of this man, along with other women naked, as he made fun of them, as he taunted them, and their clothes in a pathetic pile that lay next to him. She remembered her sister who died at the hands of this man and others like him. And now he was standing in front of her, and this is what he said. He said, Fraulein, you mentioned Ravensbrook in your talk. Well, he obviously didn't recognize her. He said, I was a guard there. Since that time, I've become a Christian. And I know that God has forgiven me for the cruel things I did there. But I would like to hear it from your lips as well. Fraulein, will you forgive me? Corey said that she couldn't raise her hand. She couldn't look at him. She couldn't move. She whispered a prayer. And still her hand couldn't move. She began to be embarrassed that here was this, this man standing in front of her. She had been talking about forgiveness, but she couldn't move as, as he put his hand in front of her. So again, she whispered a prayer. Dear Jesus, I cannot forgive him. But give me your strength, please. She said it was a, a power that didn't belong to her, that raised her hand. And as their hands clasped, she felt a, a feeling warmth penetrate the whole of her body. And she found herself saying these words, I forgive you, brother, with all my heart, I forgive you. A power. The power of the risen Christ. He is alive today. He forgave you and me on the cross. He's given us that gift of forgiveness. And because he rose from the grave, the power of his Holy Spirit alive in you and me today has the power, the power of, of peace, of healing for a broken world. It's a power that doesn't come from the left or the right. It doesn't come from dividing the sheep from the goats. It doesn't come from, from separating us and them. It doesn't come from Democrat or Republican. It's a power that's given through Jesus Christ. It's a, it's a peace that's given, not as the way the world gives peace, but a peace that's given only through Jesus Christ. 2 Timothy 1, 7. 
says, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and discipline. Jesus has given that power to you and me, a healing power to go out into the world to offer, offer His forgiveness, to offer His power and peace, to offer the power of His, his love and His discipline. His forgiveness to all who will receive it. John 1, 12 says, But to all who received Him, to them He gave the power to become children of God. His power, it's given this day. It's a power that surpasses all our comprehension and it guards our hearts and it guards our minds. There's a world out there that needs to know that kind of power. And this morning, I believe that you're just the one to tell them. Christ is risen. He's risen indeed. May you know the power of His forgiveness, the power of His peace, the power of His love. And this day, this day, may you share it with others. Pray with me. Jesus, the gift of your forgiveness. It's what we celebrate this day. That on the cross, all that is past is wiped away. All that's present is wiped away. And all the, all the, the future sins we might forgive, it's wiped away. That on this day, we celebrate that. We celebrate the gift of your resurrection. That on this day, we have power. Power over that brokenness over that sin, over all the things that would destroy us. A power of peace and healing. May that power, your power, live through us and go into a world that needs to know you. Lord, use us. Use us. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thanks again for joining us today. Um, just a reminder, if you'd like to watch the entire worship service, you can do so via live stream at 9 o'clock and 11.15 a.m. You can also view the service on demand a little bit later this afternoon at rumc.com slash sermons. Also, if you have any prayer requests, we would love to hear about those. You can send those in to pray at rumc.com. Also, if you'd like to give of your tithes and your offerings, you can do that online as well. And that's at rumc.com slash giving. Uh, thanks again for joining us today and for honoring God with your presence. We hope and pray that you have a wonderful week and we look forward to seeing you again next week. Thank you for joining us. My name's Tom Davis. I'm senior pastor here at Roswell United Methodist Church. Our mission is to help people live a Christ-centered life. And we do it because we're biblical, we're welcoming, and we're compassionate. I'd like to welcome you. I'd like to welcome you here in person. We haven't been able to do that in a while. And I'd like to welcome you to 814 Mimosa Boulevard. We have a 9 o'clock service and we have two 1115 services. I hope that you'll join us here in person. Or if you can't do that, join us here on our website or through one of our social media pages. Thank you very much for joining us.